Father, what a wonderful thought it is that you teach the sun to bring a new day, that the sun and all of its power and, and glory that we see from creation is but a student of yours. And creation sings, God, you reign. Lord, if, if we're not willing to cry out worship to you, we know that you're able to make the rocks from the ground worship you because you're worthy of it and you give us the privilege to sing of your glory and to give you praises. So I pray that we would find great joy in that. We would exult in that, that as you increase and we decrease, our joy increases, just as John the Baptist said. So I pray as we open your word now and, and we see more of your glory in, in the scripture, I pray that your word would go out in power, in the, in the power of the spirit, that we wouldn't just see this as a time where we're reading words on a page or a man is speaking, but we would, we would see it as the most important part of our week where we're hearing from you as a gathered church. So um, glorify yourself in this time, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, please turn in your copy of God's holy and perfect word to Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 3. This week as I prepared this sermon, <clears throat> I looked out my window in the study there. And I thought, the thought came to me just how much I take creation for granted. It's easy to do, especially in our day where the pace of life seems so fast. We're constantly filled with screens and podcasts and deadlines and projects. How easy it is to lose our wonder over creation all around us. So just think for a moment how your senses interact with creation. And we don't even notice it. We just assume it now. So for example, how many of you consciously thought about the coolness of the door resting in your palm as you opened to come into church this morning? Or when's the last time you stood outside and closed your eyes and just felt the rays of the sun land on your face? Or walk across your grass and you feel the individual blades of grass submit as you step on them. Or when's the last time you sat under a good shade tree and felt the ridges from an immovable trunk press into your back? Now, these are all small experiences of creation that we just assume every day. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I mean, you you can't go around throwing a parade for every sensation you feel. But I'm simply pointing out that there is an amazing design of God all around us, which means every opportunity presents another chance for us to worship and to acknowledge the God of this creation. This design of creation from God is exactly the creation we read about in, in Genesis. Genesis chapter 1 may be one of the most popular verse, chapters in the Bible because for so many of us, we start out maybe each year with a good Bible reading plan and we get to Genesis 1 and we read it and by the time we get to Leviticus, maybe we'll say, we'll do it next year. So Genesis 1 is popular, but I hope we'll see it in some fresh eyes this morning. So last week we began to study through this book. I covered two verses uh, that set the foundation for the book. And this week, I want to cover the rest of chapter 1, which is the rest of the creation account. So look with me there in Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 3. We'll read through the chapter. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. Verse 9, and God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which 
is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit, and which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and seasons, and for the days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. Verse 17, And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw it was good. There was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. Verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold... I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with its seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. <clears throat> Preaching one sermon on all of creation is like trying to look at one ray of sun of the sun. There's so much here. There's so much to say. I could very easily have six points today, one for each day of creation. So point one, God made day one. Point two, God created day two. But that would be more like a, a commentary. That would just be me simply restating what the Bible already says to you, and that would not be a sermon. So, uh, here's a window into how I think about sermons. Sermons are not just saying what the Bible says. Sermons are meant to communicate to a people a message from God through the Bible, and only through the Bible. I haven't fully done my job if I just tell you what it says and what it means. A sermon is to point out what the text means for you in real time today in light of the original meaning. So it's not just God created the world in six days, but it's God created the world in six days and here's what it means for you, why it matters, what you should believe in response, what God calls you to in response. So I'm not simply going to talk about what happens on each day of creation where you're left thinking, okay, what happened on day four or five? And I'm not going to get into the various views on creation. I'm going to assume for this message the three truths that I talked about last week. The truth of there is a God, He created all things, and He has authority over all things. So in this sermon, instead of focusing on the various details of creation, what happened on the various days, I want to focus on the nature of the Creator as He's creating. What do we learn about God as He's creating in Genesis 1? 
Moses was writing this book among the people on their way to the promised land. The people had seen all sorts of miraculous signs about God, and Moses uses this book to introduce them to the God of these great signs. And Moses uses this book to introduce you to the God of Genesis 1. So there are four truths that we learn about God from Genesis 1 as he created. Four truths. Here's, here we go. Number one, the God who establishes light and darkness separates light and darkness. The God who establishes light and darkness separates light and darkness. This is very easy to see in verses 3 through 5 where it says that God said, let there be light, and there was. God saw the light was good. God separated light from darkness. He called the light day. He called the darkness night. There was evening and there was morning. There's this literal separation going on here between physical light and physical darkness. This is one of the first created acts of God. However, I want to be clear that this is a literal separation here between literal light, literal darkness, but we also see a preview of redemption here. A preview of what is to come, of what is a theme that's going to be throughout the entirety of the Bible, this theme of light versus darkness. And even though God is dealing with literal light and darkness in Genesis 1, we can't help but to see the contrast between the two throughout the rest of the Bible. Light versus dark, good versus evil, righteousness versus wickedness, integrity versus corruption, life versus death. So I want to take you just on a really quick flyover of the storyline of the Bible. So we see this theme of light and darkness woven throughout. This is fascinating. So it obviously starts in creation here that we see the text we just read. But then as you get into Exodus, the people are in need of deliverance from Egypt. And God uses darkness as a means of judgment. Exodus 10, 21 says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven and let their be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness that was to be felt. And then as the people transition into the years of the kings, we see that God's law, His word, His commands are referenced as light. So Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. In Proverbs, you see the two contrasted together. Proverbs 4, 18 through 19 says this, The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. But the, the way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. And then as the people transition into the years of the prophets, and the people are continually sinning against God. They're sitting in darkness. There's a promise of light to come in the prophecy. Isaiah 9, 2 says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them light shone. And Micah 7, 8 says, Rejoice over me not, O enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness... The Lord will be my light. And at the conclusion of the Old Testament, what happens? God goes dark. No more new, no, no more new prophets. No new words of Scripture. It goes dark. And then the New Testament starts. And how does the New Testament start? It's the coming of Jesus. Light comes. And as Jesus begins his ministry in Matthew 4, 16, we read this. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. For those dwelling in the region, the shadow of death, a light on them has dawned. We even hear Jesus say words in his ministry about himself, like John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. Think about how staggering it would have been for them to hear about this world that God created. And Jesus says that he's the light. And then as Jesus begins to build his church, he says in Matthew 5, 14, you are the light. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. But we also know from Jesus that not everyone's a part of the light. Jesus said in John 3, 19, the light has come, but people love the darkness over the light because their works were evil. 
And those who love the darkness, Jesus said in Matthew 8, 12, that they would experience judgment for all eternity and what he's described as being thrown into outer darkness and a place where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And as the church begins to grow in the New Testament epistles, we're getting toward the end of God's Word. The church is growing, and Paul tells the church in Ephesians 5, 8 to walk in the light. Why? Because he then says in Ephesians 6, 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. And where do we see this battle of light and darkness end? Revelation 21, 23 through 26, the very end of the Bible there, John is writing about the eternal city of God. And he says this in Revelation 21, 23, and the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and the lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed, and they will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. So just catch this. All throughout the Bible, from front to back, we see a theme of light and darkness end with the triumph of light, where the nations and the kings of the world come together, no longer in turmoil and war and debate, but in perfect unity around the glory and light of Christ. In Genesis 1, we see God separate light and darkness, and we see it as a theme throughout all the Bible, but in the end, only light will endure. The nations will live together in harmony, and darkness will be no more. That is the storyline of history that God has set for us. In the beginning, He separates light and darkness. In the end, Darkness will be no more. If you've ever read the book or seen the movie, The Lord of the Rings, you'll notice that it gives a wonderful picture of this this theme. The journey begins in the beautiful shire there where everything is bright and lush and plentiful and there's parties. But as Frodo begins to bear the weight of the ring, there's a progression toward ruin He starts out as clean and put together. He's in his right frame of mind. But by the end, he is exhausted, and the the scenes in the movie become darker. He's filthy. He's beat up. He's compromised in his mind, and he's, he's on the brink of death. It's a wonderful picture of the battle between light and darkness. The God who establishes light and darkness separates light and darkness, and then he uses that separation as a picture throughout the Bible to call his creation to stay in the light. 1 John 1, 5 through 7 says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. Brothers and sisters, this morning, are you walking in the light, staying in the light? Second, the God who speaks His will accomplishes His will. The God who speaks His will accomplishes His will. This is a repetition repetition in Genesis 1. It's important to recognize. There's this phrase throughout the first chapter. It says this, and God said, let there be, and there was so. It was so. In Genesis 1, 3, we see, let there be light, and there was light. And 1, 6 and 7 says, let there be, and it was so. In 1, 9, it says, let the waters be gathered, and it was so. In, verse, in chapter 1, verse 11, let the earth sprout vegetation, and it was so. 1, 14, let there be lights, and it was so. 1, 24, let the earth, and it was so. 1, 26, let, the ma- let us make man, and it was so. Six times in one chapter, the phrase is emphasized, let there be, and it was so. And this pattern is meant to drive the truth into our hearts that God is absolutely sovereign, and whatever He speaks, wills, determines, He brings about completely unhindered. The God who speaks is the God who accomplishes. 
This is meant to make us say, wow, even creation obeys him. And if creation obeys him, is there anything he cannot do? This would have been an unashamed assault on the pagan worldviews of their day. When Moses wrote these words, they lived in a time where there was a God for everything. God for the sun, the moon, the sky, the sea, the waters. And Genesis 1 lands like a bomb right in the middle of them to say there's only one God and he created all things with his word. Your sun God is a fake. You think the moon is a God who gives light. Actually, God created the moon and gives it light. Genesis 1 is, is, isn't simply a declaration of what happened in creation. Genesis 1 serves as a confrontation to the pagan nations of the world that would claim superiority of their gods over the one true God. Psalm 30, 135, 5 through 7 says this, For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, He does. In heaven, on earth, in the seas, in the deeps, he it is who makes the clouds rise on the earth, who makes light, makes lightning for the rains, who brings forth the wind from his storehouses. This is astounding that God speaks and creation obeys. It says he positions the clouds like chess pieces. He commands lightning and it's like a light switch. He not only controls the wind, but he contains it in his storehouses. Listen, Hurricane Delta has a lot of factors involved, but the ultimate factor involved is it didn't sneak out the back door. God controls it, contains it, and lets it loose when he pleases. This is the God Genesis 1 introduces to the world. The God Genesis 1 introduces to us if he speaks and creation obeys. Is there anything he cannot do? There are many religions of the world that could amen in my sermon right now as I proclaim the power of God over creation. But here's where I would lose them. Do you know why Jesus is the central figure for Christianity? And he's debated by others, but not by Christians. Why? Do you remember when Jesus is in the boat with his disciples and the huge storm comes in Mark chapter 4. And what happens? They're, the disciples are scared for their lives. I mean, it had to be a huge storm to make these professional fishermen afraid. And where is Jesus? Do you remember? He's sleeping on a cushion in the back of the boat in the big storm. And now that's impressive, but it's not as impressive as what happens next. The disciples rush to him. They're scared for their lives. They say, wake up, won't you save us? And we read in Mark 4, 39, he says, He awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased. There was, no, there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you no faith? And listen, they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this guy that even the wind and the sea obey him? That's why Jesus is central to Christianity. Because the God of Genesis 1 speaks and creation obeys. Jesus speaks, creation obeys. Jesus is central to Christianity because Jesus is the God of Christianity. The God who speaks his will, accomplishes his will. He says, let there be, and it was so. Sometimes we may ask of God, why, why is God doing this or allowing this? You may be in a season right now where you're questioning, why would God allow this? Why is this happening? Wouldn't it be easier if God just did this? Why won't he act? I don't understand what God is doing. If he's so powerful, why won't he show up? Where is he? In those times of wondering, questioning, I want you to remember this basic truth, brothers and sisters. When you don't understand God's way, don't doubt his will. When you don't understand God's way, don't doubt his will. And just because you don't understand his will doesn't mean he's not working. 
When you don't understand God's way, don't doubt his will. And just because you don't understand his will, it doesn't mean he's not working. Psalm 115.3 says, our God, he's in the heavens. He does all that he pleases, which means the Lord does whatever he wants to do. He can do it. He has no restrictions. He has no curfew. He has no bedtime. He's not in a box. He can't be restrained. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. Listen, if it would ultimately please the Lord to change a circumstance in your life right now, however big or small it is, if it would ultimately please the Lord to change a circumstance in your life, He would do it. But when He doesn't, trust that there's a greater pleasing for your good going on in the throne room of heaven. He's got something better. And Job is the perfect example of this. Job was a man who experienced the pains of life for the greater plans of God. And in his pain, he doesn't conclude, well, God must not be powerful enough to change this circumstance. No, at the end, Job 42, he says, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. This is the God of Genesis 1. The God who speaks his will Creation obeys. He accomplishes his will. And when we don't understand his will, we don't doubt his work. Instead, we pray the words of Jesus, not my will be done, but yours. When God doesn't work according to your plan, it doesn't mean he's powerless. It means he's purposeful. Which brings us to our third point. We learn about God. Third, the God who works works for good. The God who works, works for good. We see another repetition in Genesis 1. It's important to note. At the end of each day, you'll notice that God created, and He looks over creation, and the text says five times, and God saw that it was good. This repetition enforces this truth. That which God makes, He makes good. Or you could say, that which God does, he does good or well. Any grammar people in here can correct me after the sermon there. What we see is with each passing day, God declares that it is good. But at the end of each day, there's also unfinished work because he starts working the next day as well. But it's not until the end of the work in verse 31 that he looks at the totality of creation together and declares it was very good. All God creates is good, and the total sum of His creation is very good. And here's the theological truth that we learn about God here. The God who works, works for good. It's a theme throughout the whole Bible. And this is particularly important in light of the last point, because we don't always understand God's plan, right? His will. And we start questioning, perhaps. But one thing we should never question is, is God working for good? He's always working for good without exception, specifically for his people. So Romans 8, 28 is a popular verse. It says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. This means as a child of God, you can believe that God is working for the ultimate good in your most discouraging and distressing hour. The most horrendous event in human history was the killing of the perfect and sinless Son of God. And yet, Scripture says in Isaiah 53, 10, this stunning statement that says, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. Acts 4, 28 reminds us that the death of Jesus was according to the predestined plan of God. It was the will and the plan of God to slaughter Jesus on the cross. And we may hear that and think, well, how is that working for good? And we encounter all sorts of tragic circumstances, heartbreaking things happen in our lives, and we think, how is this working for good? Where is God? Earlier I said, if it would ultimately please the Lord to change a circumstance in your life, He would do it. But when He doesn't, trust that there's a greater pleasing for your good going on in the throne room of heaven. What about the death of Jesus? Do you think God enjoyed the death of his son. Absolutely not. So why didn't he stop it? Because there was a greater purpose taking place that pleased the Lord, namely 
paying for the sins of rebels like you and me, atoning for his people, bringing glory to his name. Listen, the death and the slaughtering of Jesus should serve as an anchor for your soul to remind you that in the darkest hours of your life, God is still working for good. Romans 8, 32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? In other words, if God worked in the most troubling hour of history, will he not continue to work now? John Piper has this quote. He says, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life, and you may be aware of three of them. And I'll add to that quote, all 10,000 things God's doing, all of them are working for good. This is the God we meet in Genesis 1. And you, listen, you will not make it through the valleys of the Christian life without this truth embedded in your mind, seated in your heart, that in the darkest, most desperate, discouraging week, your broken, exhausted times of life, You have a God who is working for your good, for His glory. Let that serve as an anchor for your soul, because when the winds of life come and they seek to wreck your faith, there's a God who's working. Fourth and finally, our last point here, the God who creates blesses His creation. So far in Genesis 1, a pattern was set. God speaks, creation comes into being, He says it's good. But starting on the fifth day, we see a new aspect come into the picture. If you look at verse 21, it tells us that He created the sea creatures, the birds of the sky, and then notice verse 22, God, it says, and God blessed them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the waters and the seas, and let the birds multiply on earth. Then on the sixth day, verse 27, he created man in his image. And then verse 28 said, and God blessed them, said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. I'm not saying a lot about mankind and being made in the image of God this week. I'm going to devote the sermon next week on that. But what we, hear, what we see here from God in creation is an intentional blessing being poured out on the living, his living creatures in mankind. And this should stand out to us as we're reading chapter 1 of Genesis because he creates all things, but then all of a sudden there's special attention given, a special blessing that's given. Blessing in Scripture often shows God's favor to people. Sometimes it manifests itself in a variety of ways throughout the Scripture. Sometimes God blesses his people with land or livestock or children success, but specifically in this chapter, we see God's blessing in in three ways. First, He blesses His creation with procreation, the ability to reproduce. Verse 22, 28 says, be fruitful and multiply. Many of you have been happy to walk in obedience to the Lord's command there. Ed Powell, where are you? I'm looking at you. Second, He blesses His creation with provision. Verse 29 and 30, you'll notice that he says he gives the plants there. Uh, He gives the, the fruit of the trees there. He's providing for them food to eat. He provides for them. And then third, the blessing we see is he, be, he is personal to them. We see in the verses that he's speaking to them. We'll see in the next two chapters that God is walking among them. God comes down to man and lives among them. So he blesses them here, we see, with procreation, provision, and personableness. Now, this is critical. I know we're at the very end of the sermon, but don't miss this last point. It's important to note that these categories of blessing that God gives, reproduction, provision, personableness, they're given, they're established before the fall of mankind and sin. Before man falls into sin, God has these categories. And why is that important? It's, because, it's important because when man falls into sin, it's going to be these categories that God uses to save man out of sin. So watch this, reproduction, Matthew 1, Joseph is told, Mary will give birth to Jesus. The angel says, she will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins through childbirth. 
What about the blessing of provision? 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sake he made him, God made Christ to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him, what do we get? We might become the righteousness of God. The greatest need you have when you're standing before God is righteousness, and it's a problem because none of us have it. But the good news is God is a God who provides what his people need. Jesus provides the righteousness that comes outside of ourselves category of reproduction, provision, the last one, personableness. Romans 5, 6 says, for while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. God who walked in the garden came down and died for his people as a personal substitute. So catch this, as we meet the God of Genesis 1, yes, we walk away knowing that God creates, is the God who blesses His creation, yes, with physical reproduction, provision, and personalness from the very beginning. But we see this as a means throughout the rest of Scripture that brings us ultimate salvation in Christ. God sends a Savior through childbirth. He provides a righteousness in Jesus who then stands in our place to be a personal substitute. God knew from the very beginning when He established these categories of procreation, provision, and being personal exactly what He was doing. If you've never trusted in Jesus, I want to invite you to do that today. The God who made you calls you to repent of sin against Him and live in joyful submission to Him through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the substitute to pay for the sins of rebels like me and you. And then He rose victoriously from the grave offering eternal life to whoever would turn from sin and turn to trust in Him. I want you to do that today. As we look at the totality of Scripture, we see these categories in place from the very beginning. This is the God we meet in Genesis 1, the God throughout the rest of the Bible. He's the God who establishes light and darkness and separates light and darkness. He's the God who speaks His will and accomplishes His will. He's the God who works and works for good, and He's the God who creates and then blesses His creation. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for being a wonderful provider to us. And we see you as our creator. And we want to live in joyful submission to you through faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the picture that you give of separating light and darkness. Help us to be people who walk in the light. Thank you that you're a God who's powerful enough to speak whatever you want to happen, and it comes. Thank you that we are to know in our darkest of hours that you're always working for good. And thank you that you never leave us, but always pour your richest blessings on us through Christ. Make us the people who believe it in our hearts, not just in our minds. I pray in Christ's name. Amen.